Um, thank you for the, for the introduction, for the invitation. Very happy to be here. Um, I was asked to come and talk to you a little bit about uh, how, on, in the Canadian context, uh, we are approaching heterogeneity in ASD, how we are thinking about novel uh, therapeutic targets, and how we approach translational approaches. Um, so I'll give you a little bit of a flavor of some of the work that happens in the large Canadian networks, talk a little bit about some early um, clinical trial um, results, and maybe uh, open the discussion for later on in the day and tomorrow about how we think about translational therapeutics in this space, autism, but also other overlapping neurodevelopmental conditions. Um, so I'm a, I'm, I'm a clinician scientist. I do have a few disclosures up there. I'm happy to discuss them. None of my um, industry engagement is going to be represented in this talk, although happy to discuss that also, and a couple of patterns that are listed on the screen. OK, so challenge. So the challenge is large population of kids with neurodevelopmental conditions who have um, that affect cognition and behavior um, that cause lifelong impairment um, and disability our ability to change the long-term outcomes of kids with neurodevelopmental disorders have be, has been pretty limited. And um, we think that the development of effective and, 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 and targeted interventions has been hampered by heterogeneity, both at the phenotypic uh, point of view, uh, but also a biological variation. And um, a few years back, decided that the the place where we're going to put our resources was a, a, a large exercise that would hopefully ultimately stratify patients into homogeneous subgroups who will respond more likely to treatment than group is, groupings predicted by some diagnostic label that we actually use. So I know this is a bit nerve-wracking because uh, we are a, a group here that uh, represents academia and families and industry and diagnostic labels for certain things are extremely important in terms of how we speak to regulators, but st uh, stick with me for a second and then I'll get back to that. So um, I'm gonna skip and just get here and make a, a case as a clinician. So for those of us who also see kids with, uh, that are autistic or have ASD, depending on how they identify, the very early observation was that when we see two-year-olds, we see tons of kids who just have autism. But when we see 16-year-olds, we rarely see a kid that just has autism. So as the kids grow up, they start accumulating other diagnostic labels, some in the mental health side of things, such as anxiety and mood dysregulation, and impulsive aggression, and OCD symptoms, and ADHD, extremely common. Some on the physical health side, so a lot of gastrointestinal distress, a lot of sleep dysfunction, sensory motor differences and dysfunction that we don't always call out, um, and immune differences, we have talked about some of that today. In addition to the very well-known heterogeneity around cognition and language. So it is possible actually to see a 15-year-old with autism that's closer in phenotypic presentation to a 15-year-old with ADHD than another kid with autism. Right? So you can imagine an autistic 15-year-old who has severe intellectual disability, severe externalizing behaviors, and um, language deficit being much more different from an autistic kid who has good cognition, language, ADHD, and maybe a little bit of anxiety than an ADHD kid who also has good language and a little bit of anxiety. So then the question was, um, are the conditions as we define them mapping to biological processes that we can target with therapeutics um, that have homogeneity, is it possible that the heterogeneity within the autism picture that we see in phenotypes actually uh, maps to vast biological heterogeneity that makes translational therapeutics difficult? And it's also, is it also possible that we have biologically homogeneous groups across diagnostic labels that would be a better target for therapeutics than our original autism label? So that's where we were. The second thing I'm going to mention here is the, this phenomenon of pleiotropy. We started understanding that we had families like the one I'm showing right now, where they started with a shared genomic variant, in this case they do, 
Um, but their presentations are quite diverse. So in this case, and I have permission to share their story, the firstborn uh, boy has early onset diagnosis of autism, classical diagnosis of autism, severe internalizing behaviors such as anxiety and depression as he grew up, and mild, uh, mild intellectual disability. The second one is the girl who started with an ADHD diagnosis, then got an OCD diagnosis, then got a gender dysphoria diagnosis, and by the time she was 16, she got an ASD diagnosis, and she's in the gifted range in terms of her cognitive ability. And the little one, now we are following this family, we gave a diagnosis really early, before 18 months, um, who uh, has intact cognitive abilities, but in the average range, severe externalizing behaviors, but by the time he was three years old, he was speaking Russian. There's nobody Russian in the family. He had no natural exposure to Russian language, but he liked the pattern of language as he heard it on YouTube. And Russian speakers would say that he's actually pretty close to fluent. So in this case, we have a family that starts, Greg laughing, there is a, there, we have a family where they start with the same biological hit, but have a very, very, very different presentations. So if you think about translational therapeutics taking the approach of starting from the original genetic biology, what you would target in a clinical trial as an outcome measure would be very hard in this family. The kinds of needs that these kids have are very different. The things that they would have prioritized are very different. So what we did is um, um, we developed something called the Pond Network in Canada, the province of Ontario Neurodevelopmental Disorders Network. We took the approach that our diagnostic labels may be impairing our ability to do proper translational therapeutics. Uh, so we took a step back, recruited kids who have neurodevelopmental differences with autism, ADHD, intellectual disability, OCD, genetic syndromes, you name it. We confirmed their original diagnosis, so you can have confidence that when we say somebody's autistic, they are autistic, or somebody has ADHD, they have ADHD, but then we characterize them the exact same way, um, irrespectively of the original label. So we sequence them, we measure behavior and cognition, we image as many of these kids as possible, uh, structural functional spectroscopy, we can talk about that later if you like. Um, we started with a smaller omics platform that focused on a little bit of immune and endocrine. Now we have a large omics platform that includes microbiome and other things. And then embedded a clinical trials network into this kind of large biomarker core so that when we run clinical trials, ultimately we can use treatment response back into the classification exercise to think about who, what are the homogeneous groups, but also consider using predictive signatures from the biomarker exercise to understand treatment response. Have a mouse model, uh, which I'm gonna touch for a second, a platform that's very, very uh, focused on uh, a, a narrow kind of explanatory um, uh, need uh, in the platform. Um, and of course, has become, this has become a computational problem, so we have a large computational core. We have 4,000 kids now in this consortium across Canada. Um, it's co-designed with families and kids. Um, there are thir more than 30 investigations. There's plenty of clinicians. And so I'll show you just a tiny bit of where we are and then move to an example of how this may be translating to therapeutics. Um, I will have to say this was funded by the Ontario Brain Institute to the largest degree. So typically what we do is for every $2 that we get from the Ontario Brain Institute, we bring another one from another funding agency and you'll see them in the end. Um, so uh, multiple, mu multiple uh, sources of um, income, including industry, because their clinical trials platform now is um, trained to regulatory compliance and, and has quite a bit of expertise. And so we run our own trials and we run industry partner trials. Oops. Um, so I was going to show you just a couple of early findings from the different platforms, just to make a case for a couple of points. So genomics, it was, it was supposed to be gene first, genomics first consortium. Uh, Steve Scherer leads that. Um, one of the most recent papers from Cell where we put together all of our um, genomic architecture, new findings, 
and partnered with Missing and the Simons Complex uh, Collection to come up with a new revised 110 something list of high confidence genes, um, the usual attempt for convergence on protein protein interaction uh, exercises to understand um, targets for therapeutics, not just at the gene level, but at a neighborhood uh, metabolic pathway level, if you like. Um, the concept of convergence is something we're all talking about, but the truth is we haven't, don't have a single success yet, so we need to remember that. So this idea that genes um, interact in certain pathways, and if for that reason we can target the pathway, but not the gene, um, is something that we're hoping it's true, but we haven't proven it yet. Um, but the issue here for us was, at the end of this full exercise, we have tons of targets, um, somewhat anxiety provoking for, for thera translational therapeutics, but we also have lack of specificity of targets for ASD. So even at the genomic level, at this point, we have no variant that is specific for ASD. We find them across neurodevelopmental conditions. And at the bottom there, I don't know if I have a little, oh, I do. At the bottom there, this is a kind of a sister, the baby seed consortium in Canada, where we looked at the, the second sibling who carries the same variant as the first sibling that has ASD, the positive predictive value for autism in the second sibling with the same variant is sitting under 50%, although the positive predictive value for anything neurodevelopmental gets up to 85%. So getting a little bit stuck um, in uh, trying to understand how we're going to go about translational therapeutics if the biology is not specific to the diagnostic label, if we have too many uh, diagnostic uh, potential um, targets. And oh, I guess the most important thing here to also say is uh, even though we have 110 genes of high confidence, these are the genes that we're actually returning a clinical result to, not the variants of unknown significance that we are very interested in. We have another 10% of those. Um, we only find them in about 14% of kids. So it's nice to have the genomics, uh, but even if the genomics works in the traditional fashion, um, for the vast majority of kids, we don't have a, a, a um, high confidence uh, variant. So then our approach was to look downstream from genes, and the thing that we picked, and, and there is lots of expertise in the room, on various downstream targets was neuroimaging. So um, I'm going to start on that side of the slide and say I'm not going to spend a lot of time here, but lots and lots and lots of publications from our consortium to show that as we're increasing the sample size, we're not getting precision in the measurement. It's a very important observation, I think, we can debate it later, to say that the variability that we get, let's say, in brain imaging is not because we have a lot of noise and therefore the larger the sample size, the more precise the measurement. In fact, our, our variability increases as our si sample size increases. So remember we have now 4,000 kids in the consortium, more than 1,000 of those have been imaged. So although earlier on in our lives we had all published papers where we distinguished autism from ADHD or from whatever have you, as the sample sizes get bigger, it is very difficult at an average level, at a mean level, to distinguish these neurodevelopmental conditions um, from each other. So the only reason I put this, just tons of papers, I'm just going to use this as an example. This is autism versus controls. This is ADHD versus controls. This is ASD versus control. This is resting state connectivity across canonical networks. It doesn't actually matter for those of you who are not used to looking at these kinds of things. But what I want you to see is the pattern across the diagnosis. So the patterns look very the same, and I can tell you statistically they're not different. But they're not all the same. We're not saying that all the kids are the same. In fact, we're saying the exact opposite. Look at those error bars, enormous error bars. So a huge amount of heterogeneity within diagnosis, um, but we are not actually at the mean level separating the different categories. So then the question was, is this because this is random, imaging is not a good modality, has a lot of noise, there's a lot of individual differences, or is there biological structure to the error bar that helps with heterogeneity, that will help with translational therapeutics, right? This is how we used imaging. We took um, mice uh, where we knocked in most of the time a whole bunch of autism variants. This is just the original paper, but I'm gonna use it just to make the point. 
So I'm going to just focus on this very basic graph where you get total uh, brain volume. Uh, this is the difference from the Y type for a variety of mouse models. Just total brain volume, very crude measurement at this point. And you'll see some mice have very large brains, some, ve some uh, mice have very small brains, and everything in between. So that if you were to take a mean and put an error bar around it, you'd probably get something like that. Right? Very small change between the wild type and the, and the non-wild type in the mouse uh, with huge error bar. But this is not random. There is biological structure to our heterogeneity. It's got, we know exactly where it's coming from because we constructed it by definition when we constructed the experiment. And this is not just about big brains and small brains because if I, if I uh, rank them the exact same way and I look at cerebellum or corpus callosum or striatum, you'll see a very different part, pattern suggesting that these brains are differentially constructed. Right? So we have very many different brains that produce very similar phenotypes, which we all have talked about, but, but um, we have had trouble conceptualizing in, uh, in the human data. So what we did next, and again, I'm not going to spend time, is if we believe then that there is structure in the, in the error bar, we should be able to cluster the human imaging data to understand a little bit more biologically homogeneous groups from something that we can actually measure, like brain imaging. And again, the point here is not the actual solutions of these things. You're uh, happy to answer questions about them. But one is structural on top, and one is uh, functional at the bottom. The idea is that we are not getting clusters that are diagnosis-specific, or we get the rare little cluster that is diagnosis-specific. This is um, thickness, and this is resting state connectivity. Suggesting that we have biologically homogeneous groups in terms of their brains, we, our diagnostic label is not helping us get there when we pick them to understand response to intervention. Um, I'm going to just show one more slide on, oops, this was not moving, okay. This uh, to say, I know we can cluster everything into everything. And so for those of you who are computational people in the crowd, I don't want you to feel that we're just clustering and moving on. This is the replication cohort from Pond to HBN, to Healthy Brain Networks from New York, um, from New York, where we actually replicated the clustering exercise in a completely independent cohort. In this case, it's segregation um, in, um, and integration in resting state connectivity. So um, now we think, I don't know where this thing goes, OK. Um, now we think that we have quite a bit of heterogeneity in biology, but we can actually cluster it in meaningful groups, not just based on noise, but in meaningful groups both animal and human data. Um, how do we use that to think about translational therapeutics? Before I show you clinical trials, there's one more complication, and the complication is, what do autistic people want us to change? And so we did a very large, a robust um, prioritization exercise in Canada to try to come up with priorities. You will notice that in Canada, a couple of the priorities are actually precision health priorities. So they want to know what, for whom, when, how much, when to start, when to finish. A couple of priorities have to do with family navigation and support. But a lot of the symptoms that have been prioritized are not core symptoms. So you'll see that they prioritize emotional and behavioral regulation. They prioritized, um, where am I here? Aggress uh, aggression, self-injurious behaviors, and irritability, as we heard before. They prioritized anxiety, so internalizing symptoms. And lastly, in the top 10, we prioritize social skills. So it's, it's another little wrinkle in terms of if we are defining the conditions by, by our DSM. Um, well, first of all, nature doesn't read the DSM, and our biology seems to suggest that our DSM may not be doing a very good job at giving us biologically homogeneous groups. Secondly, our patients may not be caring about the DSM, because although they carry the labels that we give them, the things that they prioritize sometimes are not things that the regulators would give us an indication for right away. So these are conversations we, we also need to have. Having said all of this, I'm going to get into just some very quick approaches to clinical trials. So the idea then was if we change the way we approach clinical trials and we don't just borrow from the other conditions because we have similar symptoms, but take translational targets now out of the neurodevelopmental space, will we do better? And based on the, on the data that we have to date, um, we focused on 
five areas of potential uh, drug development and therapeutics um, uh, that would be applicable to neurodevelopmental conditions. Although I'm putting in the wrinkle that I would not necessarily think that it's the diagnostic label that will predict the treatment response. So I'm going to show you a couple of examples. I'm going to show you Reluzol very quickly. That uh, is a drug that hits, uh, it's a sledgehammer of a drug for those of you who are, understand pharmacology. So they understand the, um, it hits a, a pre, um, microglia release uh, of glutamine into the presynaptic space and then presynaptic and postsynaptic glutamate um, um, function. Then I'm going to show you a very quick one uh, here on transcription regulation, a GSK3 beta inhibitor. And then I'm going to show you the most, most recent arbaclofen, which is hot, hot of the analysis um, to give you a sense of where this is going. So, oops, here we go. Clinical trials, all in one slide, the first two, uh, just to make a couple of points. These are phase two trials that are running in the Canadian network. The first one was um, the first two were 60 kids, and then the next one I'm going to show you are 90, so just be careful. It's phase two. They're not powered to actually uh, answer definitive questions. So first of all, Reluzol, again, approved for ALS. Nobody, nobody actually um, is suggesting that is, this is an autism-specific drug, but it does have this impact early on, a, a sledgehammer impact on a glutamate to GABA balance or EI balance, and we can debate that construct also. So the first thing to notice is when we look at social withdrawal using the ABC, uh, we have treated for 12 weeks and then we followed up for four weeks. You have a very almost convincing trend for uh, the drug to outperform placebo but sitting on red. So consistently um, uh, from beginning of treatment you start seeing a separation but maintains all the way to 12 weeks and then when we withdraw the drug, which is of interest here, you actually maintain the effect, the separation between drug and placebo. Now it's not statistically significant and we still have these enormous error bars, right? But the second thing here is we actually measured the, th the things that people cared about and prioritized irrespectively of whether they are core symptom domains. So externalizing symptoms in this case, irritability and hyperactivity, and we actually have statistically significant separation between realizol and placebo, even in 60 people. So by going after a biological target that we think is of relevance, even though we haven't actually stratified yet for the group that is most likely to benefit, we're actually getting convincing trends in core symptom domains, statistical separation in the things that people prioritize, um, but still large error bars, right? Now, titaglucid is GSK3 beta inhibitor for those of you who are interested. Oh, by the way, in terms of the approach, we take repurposed drugs that are on the, in the, on the market, but we also partner with communities, with uh, pharma, to find um, drugs that have been solved, uh, but we think have really good mechanisms that have been tried for other things. So titaglucid was originally uh, tried um, in dementia and failed. We were not disturbed by that. In fact, we were not quite sure it failed when we looked at the data, but it has a mechanism we care about, and so we brought it in based on mechanism. So you'll see again that we're getting a very similar pattern on social withdrawal. We get kind of this very convincing kind of pattern of separation, although we still have large error bars and we're not uh, reaching statistical significance. Although in this case, repetitive behaviors as measured by BRBSR is actually pretty significant, but be careful because it is phase two, so I don't want to oversell anything. Um, and in this case, we're getting better at actually measuring target en engagement, which is in this case phosphorylation of AKD. Um, um, we couldn't actually use target engagement as a predictor of treatment response because it's like an all or nothing kind of thing, as you can see, so we had very little variability there. So in this case, our attempt to see how much uh, inhibition of phosphorylation of AKT we get uh, did not work to help us predict treatment response. But still large error bars, right? So last thing I'm going to show you on this is um, some of you are familiar with the story of our back side therapeutics. Uh, was created and failed based on, the, on this particular compound. Um, GABA B agonist, uh, one of the enantiomers of baclofen, which allows us to get to much higher doses and, and a better tolerability. Um, I'm happy to discuss after if there are certain questions about how we had adapted the original protocol from Seaside Therapeutics to deal with some of the problems of that original protocol. 
But basically what we did is we said two things. We're going to try to um, improve a little bit on our placebo response, which we haven't even discussed here. Um, we're going to try to narrow a little bit the range of inclusion criteria in a way that was predicted by the seaside therapeutics to be more productive. But also because we have this problem of sample sizes, we partnered with the European Consortium on Autism, which is aims to trials. We agreed on the same protocol for primary and secondary measures. Our regulators accepted that protocol, so both Health Canada and the European Medicines Agency. We ran the trials the exact same way, although they are separate trials. And then we did a little bit of biomarker work to explore now how we're going to get that error bar down. So I'm going to show you a little bit fresh, fresh off analysis um, the Canadian data, I can tell you that the, I cannot show you yet the European data, but I can tell you the thing that makes us um, excited is that they look the same. The two studies run in completely different cohorts with the same protocol are extremely close in terms of their results. We've almost never replicated anything in this phase, so we're getting interested. So um, 90 kids this time, uh, pretty safe actually, I'm happy to discuss safety. We didn't even get the expected side effects that we were expecting, a couple of withdrawals. Primary outcome measure was, uh, first of all, we ran this in the pandemic and this was just not fun. <laughs> and also we had happened to change our primary to a social skills primary, because remember in our top 10, social skills made it as number 10 from our patients, and so we want to actually honor the priorities of our patients, so we moved from social withdrawal to social skills, which is a harder target to move based on a drug. But um, this is basically the visual representation of the data for the total uh, social um, standard score. Again, not reaching statistical significance with the 90, but uh, twice as much is the gain in the active group is twice as much as the gain in the placebo and it includes minimum clinical important difference. More importantly, if you look at the subdomains, the play domain during the pandemic we could not change because there were no playgrounds. Everybody was shut down. The questions are, do you go to the playground, do you play with other kids in the playground, that kind of thing. But uh, coping skills, um, we had pretty significant uh, change in the active group uh, compared to placebo. And interpersonal relationships, again, more variability than, ex than, than we would like, but Interpersonal relationships during the pandemic was basically with your family members, school was closed, um, other things were closed. Now, the reason um, we're particularly interested is because we actually included one more measure in this study as a secondary measure called the autism impact measure. I'll be totally honest, we included it just to see if it has sensitivity to change. Um, it had not been used in a trial before, but you'll see this massive change uh, that separates from placebo now with our GABA B agonist. Um, from um, on the total score of the aim here, um, but also in certain some domains. So we get it on repetitive behaviors, we get it on atypicality, and we get it on social reciprocity. So, and the Europeans have the exact same result on an independent cohort. So we're getting pretty confident that we are actually having a translational target that actually matters something, but we still have variability. So this is my last one on variability now. So we were trying to think about how we're going to capture biology in a way that captures something of relevance to autism, but also of relevance to the mechanism of the drug, uh, so that it has a chance to uh, change. We picked two things between the Europeans and the, uh, and the Canadians. We picked EEG, which I'm not going to show you today, and then we picked um, sensory processing. Because, with, because this is Nick Butts, who uh, used to be at Kennedy Krieger and now is at KCL. Um, and we know something about paradigms that have to do with sensory thresholds. So sensory thresholding, so you can have, like in this case, you have a vibration on this little device um, that starts really, really low and starts increasing. And we're asking the kids when they start feeling it the first time. Then we have a second one where we're asking for discrimination. We are starting a second one and asking them to tell where they experience both. And then we have an adaptation paradigm where we accept, expect people to kind of habituate to the to the sensory stimulus, um, and, um, and we care about this one because we think that some of those are actually, well, we know a lot of those are GABA-mediated, but we think some of those are GABA-B-mediated. So very quickly, again, just, just to, to start the conversation, um, we have um, the drug actually did change sensory thresholds, so that's one basic thing to say. 
So a GABA B agonist is in decreasing your sensory threshold when we're talking about sensory processing. And then we looked at the change in sensory processing versus the change in our aim measure, which was our autism outcome measure, something that we think the regulators may be more willing to accept. And you'll see in our active drug, our treatment, our change in the um, uh, sensory processing uh, actually correlates with change in our um, outcome measure, although it's not happening in the placebo arm. So we feel that we have now a biomarker that can capture some variability at baseline that actually changes with our drug, um, and it is drug specific. It is, uh, you, we're getting re rid of the placebo response because it does not actually matter to the placebo group. So I'm gonna stop here um, so we can have a, a chance for a question or two. This takes a village to do, and I hope you all know that, um, including um, researchers, clinicians, and family members, and a very active, actually, youth council, um, and all the funding agencies that um, contribute to this work, but mostly um, the Ontario Brain Institute, who contribute two-thirds of the budget. So I'm gonna leave it at that, and don't know if we have questions.